Hello, everyone. Well, we know him as an epic war chief and hero to many. For all his origins, they begin in a time of great turmoil. It was the time in which Kil Jaden of the Burning Legion manipulated the orcs into abandoning the elements in exchange for fell magic and formed the hordes. All that so that they could be used to exterminate the Draenei on their world of Draenor. But the orcs didn't know this. They thought that they were following the guidance and wisdom of their ancestors. Just a few of them kept their eyes open, looked around and saw the changes that were happening to their planets and their people figured that this wasn't right. Amongst those few orcs were Thrall's parents, Duratan and Draka of the Frostwolf clan. They tried to speak out, they tried to protect their people, but there was no hiding for the oncoming storm and the plans of the Legion would be carried out. When the Horde finally did manage to exterminate Prophet Velen and the Draenei, or at least so Kil Jaden fought, he abandoned them to their fate left them behind on a broken, corrupted world, where basic needs such as food and water were very hard to come by. Devouring demonic blood and using the fell also had its effects on the orcs, both inside and out, and they were turning on each other. Something had to change real fast, and luckily for the orcs, the legion wasn't done with them quite yet. Their leader Sargeras figured that they could use the orcs for another plan for weakening a little planet known as Azeroth, a world that the Burning Legion desperately wanted to conquer. Under his guidance, the Dark Portal was created, and the Horde invaded Azeroth. Now speaking out against all the things that had happened, it did mean that the Frost Wolves eventually got exiled, but seeing how their actions, how their curse even passed on to their children, Duratan and Draka could not stay away, could not let their people be misguided by these dark forces. A secret meeting with their longtime friend Orgrim Doomhammer. It had to make plans of usurping leadership, steering them away from this doom path. A secret meeting, but not completely unknown. There was a spy within Orgrim's clan who led Draka and Duratan right into the hands of assassins. Trying to save their people would result in their demise. An orphan young Thrall, or Goel as his parents would have named him. This name Thrall meaning slave. It was given to him by the man that found him abandoned in the wilds. A dayless Blackmoor came across this gruesome sight. A bunch of dead orcs and an infant left to die, resisting his instincts to immediately slay the child. A dayless instead decided to take him with him and raise him as a gladiator. This took place just before the first war ended, and Adelis would become quite the distinguished veteran of the second war, the war over Azeroth, which was won by the Alliance. And the defeated orcs, they either ran back home, they were slain on the spot, they hid away in small pockets on the world, or they surrendered. Those that chose the last option found themselves locked away within internment camps, and a day's reputation, it had earned him leadership over these prisons, and that's where Fro would spend his childhood. At least, if they could manage to keep him alive. The ugly little thing it wouldn't eat had grown pale and quiet over the last several days. The beast was dying, which had enraged Blackmore. Now the answer to his survival came from Tarifa Foxton. Her father had been Blackmore's servant for ten years now, and was discussing Thrall's situation with his wife, who served in the kitchens. She had recently given birth to a baby boy, and while listening in, Tarifa thought that the answer was obvious. They were trying to feed a little baby meat. But that's not what babies eat. They drink milk, like her baby brother did. Adelis had not even considered this, and that's the way orcs were viewed by so many. So alien, so monstrous, that they didn't even consider that there might be similarities. From the mouth of a child came their answer, and after pleading with his wife for a bit, Mrs. Foxton was willing to feed Thrall. Sadly, Tarifa's little brother died of a fever, and when Thrall was old enough to eat a vile concoction of blood, cow's milk and porridge with his own small hands, the guards took him away as well. Tarifa cried then. One brother had passed away. The other was now taken away. She got smacked for the efforts and pretended to never talk about Frau again. To the outside, she appeared to be the ever-obedient child. But she vowed that she would never forget this strange creature that had almost been like a younger brother to her. Never. She would be one of the few bright lights in Frau's gruesome life. He wasn't exactly treated with respect or kindness by Blackmore and the others, as they trained him to become a powerful gladiator. The one in charge of his training was a bit of an exception. This was a massive human going by the name of Sergeant. He had trained thousands of recruits, in which each group he offered them the same challenge. Rip his earring from his ear, and they would be allowed to beat him to a pulp. 
Without warning, Sergeant came at the untrained, unexperienced Frau, but something inside of him clicked in place. His bulky form always made him feel sluggish and clumsy, fear of upsetting his master Blackmore or doing something wrong. But here in the arena, within battle, his vision narrowed to one single goal, kill Sergeant, and he got really close. Sergeant's experience and speed it did give him a good run for his money, but not even that was enough to hold back the might of this orc. He had nearly squeezed the life out of his trainer, thinking to himself, if, if only I could get my hands around Blackmore's neck. And that thought made him hesitate, giving the others the chance to throw him off the sergeant. Yet sergeant wasn't mad. Quite the opposite. He praised Frau for getting closer than any had before. But in his rage, he has forgotten about his true objective. His bloodlust would serve him well in some fights. But in the arena, he would have to be more present. More inside his mind rather than his gut. Some foes will have to be slain, while others will have to be spared. Fro dared to ask the question on his mind. Sergeant, sometimes you said sometimes you don't kill. Why not? Sergeant regarded him evenly. It's called mercy, Fro, he said quietly. And you'll learn about that too. Mercy. Under his breath, Fro turned a word over his tongue. It was a sweet word. And perhaps Blackmore should have learned it as well. Beatings from his often drunk master were not uncommon for our thrall, nor was he ever allowed to forget that he was a slave. Later on, another plan formed in Adelis' mind. If he could teach Thrall a little bit more, some tactics, how to read, how to lead, then he could use his slave gladiator to lead the rest of the imprisoned orcs. Not for the greatness of the alliance, mind you, but for his own gain and power. He could already envision it, ruling from up high. In a different timeline, he might have been successful. Now the one ordered to bring for all the books to study with, that was Tarifa, who also snuck in a small, tightly folded piece of parchment. A little note, letting him know that she had not forgotten about him. The beginning of many secret letters sent between the human and the orc. Through her letters, Thrall's mind was open to a world beyond his cell. A world of art and beauty and companionship. A world of food beyond rotting meat and slop. A world in which he had a place. He knew that Tari did not have a privileged life. She was a servant in her own way, as much in Thrall as the orc who bore the name. But she did have friends, and she was not spat upon, and she belonged somewhere. Thrall had no people of his own. The only thing that he had left to remind himself of the days with his parents, that was a fraying square of cloth that bore the symbol of a white wolf head on a blue field. Now you could not just walk up to Blackmore and tell him that he was done being a slave. That he was ready to find his own family. And so, Fro remained where he was, fighting his battles in the arena, earning great victories for his master. Things went rather well for Blackmore, and the reputation of his pet orc spread far and wide. One time, he had Fro fight nine matches in a row. Eight of those, his pet orc had won, each victory bringing home more gold. The ninth was ill-advised. Even Sergeant told Blackmore to let Fro rest. That it was enough for today, but the drunkard Dalus wouldn't hear it. His slave, being tired and injured, was pitted against a massive ogre who kicked the absolute crap out of him, beating Thrall to an inch of his life. The fighters were separated, and Thrall was brought back to his prison. He expected healers to come, as they always did. Sure enough, he had lost the final match, but he did have earned victory in eight of them, something that he had never done before. But the healers were not the first ones to show up. A severely drunk Blackmore was pissed. A thousand gold he had lost because of Fro. Despite his injuries, Blackmore started to kick him and did not stop until the next group came in. A group of guards took their turn beating him up. And this was the thing that broke our Fro. Broke the chains of his mind that bound him to Adelis. Sergeant had shown up as soon as he heard about the beating and pulled the guards of an unconscious Thrall. He woke up to the healers and Sergeant gave him praise, was impressed on how he had performed, but it was too little and too late. Never again would he let himself be used like that. Once he would have cringed and vowed to be better, to do something to earn the love and respect that he so desperately craved. Now he knew that he would never find it here. Not as long as Blackmore owned him. He reached for his writing tools and wrote a note to the only person that he could trust. Tori, on the next dark moons, I plan to escape. 
She was at his side, of course, risking it all to buy him his freedom. A fire was started to distract the guards. A massive black cloak was already waiting for him to hide him in the night. Frau escaped the place that had kept him imprisoned for so many years and reunited with his sister in spirit. For ten years now, they'd been riding one another and now she could finally hug him again. There wasn't a lot of time to talk though, but enough time to realize that her life with Blackmore wasn't easy either. She was the mistress to this cruel man, and hearing what her life with him was like, it filled Frau with outrage. She couldn't escape with him though, her life was here in Dernhold, Well, his journey was to find his people. They call you a monster, but they're the monsters, not you. Farewell, Thrall. For the first time, our young Thrall tastes freedom. On the quest of finding where he came from, finding where he belonged. It would be best to find other free orcs in the wilds, but he wasn't even sure if those were still a thing. Tarifa had also been kind enough to mark out the other internment camps so that he could avoid them as best as he could, and Arvral set out for one of those immediately. Along the way, he does get captured by humans that bring him back to one of these camps, which works out rather nicely, except for all of his stuff getting stolen. Inside, he gets to witness the absolute horrible conditions that his people lived in. Huddled everywhere were dozens, perhaps hundreds of orcs. Some of them sat in puddles of their own filth, their eyes unfocused, their sharp tusk jaws slack. Others paced back and forth, muttering incoherently. Some slept tightly curled up on the earth, seeming not to care even if they were stepped on. There was an occasional squabble, but even that apparently sapped too much energy, for it died down almost as quickly as it begun. This demonic curse that was running through the orc's veins, it had quite the side effects. And he got to chat with few of them, learning more about their history with the Legion, and soon enough he realized that it wasn't the walls or the guards that kept the orcs imprisoned. They had the strength and they had the numbers to fight the way out of there. What they truly lacked was the fire, the will to do so. If he was going to set his people free, he would have to be their fire. Soon enough, word reached Blackmore that the other camp might have his pet orc. With his arrival and a distraction, Thrall manages to use the opportunity to just climb over the walls and get out of there. He was told that Gromash Hellscream and the Warsong clan were still free, were still fighting. They were his next target to find, and soon enough he finds himself being tested to see if he was even worthy to speak with Grum. First, a test of his fighting skills, which our experienced gladiator managed to win. He did not kill them though, despite that being the custom for the war songs. Then the second test, a test of will, in which they presented him a small human child. Not a threat to them right now, but the boy would grow up and pick up arms against them. Kill him for all or we promise you, you will not leave this cave alive. And yet again, Thrall decides to show mercy. Then Grom shows up, impressed by the newcomer. They had fought and slain, even killed children and bathed in their blood. And look at where they got them, hiding away and living off scraps. Thrall's way was surely a sign of the ancestors, a new path for the orcs to follow. So Grom welcomed Thrall to the war song. In the coming days with the war song, Grom and Thrall grew close. His orcish was upgraded, while still speaking with a pretty heavy accent. More details of their past were explained, and the cloth with the Frostwolf symbol, it pointed him towards the Frostwolf clan, and that's where his journey would take him next. Despite Grom wishing to just immediately team up and go liberate their people, winter was coming, and finding the clan of his parents, it was something that Thrall needed to do first. With Blackmore's men moving in closer, it was time for him to leave and journey on to the Altrek Mountains. Their people would have to wait a little bit longer, but liberation would come. Finding his way to the Frostwolf clan, it meant that he could speak with Drekvar, who had taken over leadership of the clan. The blind shaman is able to see more than others, and that small piece of cloth, it tells him all he needs to know. Once more, they test him to see if he was both humble and proud. Humble by not just showing up and immediately demanding a rank just because of his father and his mother. And proud by not letting others just walk over him. Again, he passes the trials and he learns much about his parents, the orcish history, the dark bargains with the demons and how the elements were upset with them for a being abandoned in exchange for fell. It had been many decades since a new shaman had risen up amongst their people, but Thrall had a connection. A strong potential, which soon enough was embraced by the elements. First there was earth, then there was air, fire, 
water. And finally, the fifth, the spirit of the wilds. They all accepted him and would come to his aid when he asked them, and they agreed with his request. One of the first new shaman to rise up amongst the orcs in decades. As the cold winter time passed on, Thrall learned more about the orcs and the customs of his clan. As the name implies, these frost wolves, they have a close bond with wolves, and at one point he goes through a bonding ceremony. They do not simply demand the wolves to obey their wishes. Rather, it's the wolves themselves that pick their lifelong companions. Snowsong chose him, and he knew without understanding quite how he knew that she would be by his side until one of them left his life behind. And finally, they were visited by a wandering hermit who'd haunted Thrall told him that his plans of liberating their people, that they were foolish. The frost wolves had the right of it, hiding away in the mountains, far away from the humans. It was their best course of action. Better to live as a coward than to die a hero. Words that enraged our thrall, and he challenged his newcomer to a fight. What he didn't know was that this hermit was actually Orgrim Doomhammer. His father's longtime friends had been devastated when he found out about their deaths, but he did not let it go to waste. Their warning was the fire he needed to claim leadership of the Horde, lead their people through their war in Azeroth. A war they had obviously lost, and while the others had given up, they've given in to their lethargy. Orgrim was still willing to fight. Grum had told him of the son of Duratan, and he had come to check out if the rumors were true. Considering that it took eight frost wolves to drag the enraged fall off of him, he got more than he bargained for. But he knew that he had found his second in command, his second to unite the frost wolves with the war songs and go out to liberate their people. But just riding out and tearing down the walls, it wasn't going to be good enough. Their people needed a fire in their hearts, and Fro would give it to them. Pretending to be a broken orc, he once again allowed himself to be captured. From within, he shared stories of their history, of what was going on on the outside, that there was once again a shaman who walks amongst them. It's definitely not easy, but slowly that spark returns to the eyes of his people, and they follow him to freedom. Camp after camp is liberated, until in one fight, Orgrim is hurt bad, and he passes on not only his armor, not only the legendary weapon called the Doomhammer, he also passed on, despite Thrall believing himself to be unworthy, the title of War Chief. I am the War Chief. For Doomhammer! For the Horde! With the numbers they had, it was time to go for the head of the beast and bring Durnhold low. The night before the attack, Thrall spoke with his sister Tarifa, warning her of what was to come. But she couldn't stay with them. If she did, Adelis might unleash his anger upon her family. But knowing what was to come, at least she could keep them safe. That was until she sneaked back in and was greeted by her master. He had known about her treachery ever since they had found the letters taken when Thrall was captured first. The next morning, our war chief was greeted by an extremely drunk Adelis Blackmore. Despite their history, Thrall still tried to go for a negotiation. All he wanted was their people to be free. There was no need to throw away lives on either side. I ask you once more, Blackmore, negotiate or die. Blackmore stood up to his full height. Thrall now saw that he held something in his right hand. It was a sack. Here's my answer, Thrall. He reached into the sack and pulled something out. Thrall couldn't see what it was. Then the object came hurling toward him and struck the ground, rolling to a stop at his feet. Tarifa's blue eyes stared sightlessly up at him from her severed head. That's what I do with traitors, screamed Blackmore dancing madly on the walkway. That's what we do with people we love who betray us, who take everything and give nothing, who sympathize with double-damned orcs. Thrall didn't hear him. Thunder was rolling in his ears. His knees went weak and he fell to the earth. Gorge rose in his throat and his vision swam. It couldn't be. Not Tari. Surely not even Blackmore could do such an abominable thing to an innocent. But blessed unconsciousness would not come. He remained stubbornly awake, staring at long blonde hair, blue eyes and a bloody severed neck. Then the horrible image blurred. Wetness poured down his face, his chest heaving with agony. Frodi called Tari's words to him so long ago. These are called tears. 
They come when we are so sad, so soul sick. It's as if our hearts are so full of pain. There's no place else for it to go. But there was a place for the pain to go. Into action. Into revenge. Red flooded Thrall's vision now. And he threw back his head and screamed with rage such as he had never before experienced. The cry burned his throat with its raw fury. The sky boiled. Dozens of lightning strikes split the clouds, dazzling the eye for a moment. The furious peals of crashing thunder that followed nearly deafened the men at the fortress. Many of them dropped their weapons and fell to their knees, gibbering terror at the celestial display of fury that so clearly echoed the wrenching pain of the orc leader. Blackmore laughed, obviously mistaken Thrall's rage for helpless grief. When the last peals of thunder died down, he yelled. They said, you couldn't be broken. Well, I broke you, Thrall. I broke you. Thrall's cry died away, and he stared at Blackmore. Even across the distance, he could see the blood drain from Blackmore's face. As his enemy, now, finally began to understand what he had roused with his brutal murder. Thrall had come hoping to end this peacefully. But Blackmore's actions had destroyed that chance utterly. He would not live to see another sunrise. And his keep would shatter like fragile glass before the orcish attack. Thrall. It was Hellscream. Uncertain as to Thrall's state of mind. Thrall, his chest still raw with grief. And tears still streaming down his broad green face. Impaled him with his glance. Mingled sympathy and approval showed in Hellscream's expression. Slowly, harnessing his powerful self-control, Thrall raised the great warhammer. He began to stamp his feet, one right after the other, in a powerful, steady rhythm. The others joined him at once, and very faintly, the earth trembled. The powers of the elements under Thrall's command opened a way into the keep, into a final one-on-one duel with his former master, the man who had tried to shackle his heart and his mind, who had taken the life of one so close to him. Another fight, it did not last long, the rage of Tari's death giving him all the strength that he would ever need, but Blackmore didn't die at once. He lay, gasping, fingers impotently clutching his sides as blood pumped out in a staggering rush of reds. He stared up at Thrall, his eyes glazed, blood trickled from his mouth, and to Thrall's astonishment, he smiled. You are what I made you. I am so proud, he said, and then sagged against the wall. These words stung, but Drekfor explained that Blackmore had been right. Thrall was what he had made him, but so did Tarifa and Sergeant, Hellscream, Doomhammer, Drekfar, and even Snowsong. You are what each battle made you. You are what you have made of yourself. You are the lord of the clans. And our lord let those that surrendered, like sergeants who had taught him the meaning of mercy, he let them go. If they laid down their weapons, sergeant did so after Thrall finally claimed his earring. He did pass them on a message for the rest of the alliance, to tell them what had happened this day, to tell them that if they choose the path of peace, they will find us ready to engage in trade and cooperation with them, provided they free the rest of my people and surrender land, good land for our use. If they choose the path of war, they will find an enemy the likes of which they have never seen. And after so many years of searching, Thrall finally knew where his true destiny lay, knew deep in his bones who he was. Thrall, son of Duratan, war chief of the Hordes, he had come home. But that's just the start of Thrall's journey, as many more of their people were in need of liberation. And the old enemy of the orcs would soon enough arrive on the planet to take another shot at conquering it. That part of the story though, and so much more, we're gonna save for next week. So for now, thank you very much for watching everyone. Subscribe if you like my videos. Leave a like if you enjoyed this one. And until next time, see ya! A weapon to break the chains of oppression. A bastion for the hunted. Lost. A family bound by blood and honor. And if our enemies do not give us peace, we will give them war! Victory or death! This I pledge 
as your war chief. Until the end of days, I live and die.